Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webinar today. This is Robert Kerr, the Chief Software Architect of Haystacks Analytics. I'm here with uh, Dr. Bob Schrag, my Chief Scientist, also of Haystacks, and Jans Osman, of the CEO of Franz Incorporated. Uh, first, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, please share them via chat. We'll address as many of them as we can uh, at the end of the discussion. If we don't get to yours, feel free to send us an email and we'll reply offline. Uh, so a second note, video and our slides will be available on both the Franz and Haystacks websites shortly after the completion of our talk today. So if you miss anything or want to go back and revisit them, uh, you'll be able to do so after the, the discussion today. So today, we're going to talk about some of the work we're doing in the area of insider threat. Uh, before we begin, however, I'd like to mention that this work is made possible in no small part due to the relationship we have with our partner, Franz. Uh, Franz techno technology is an integral part of our approach, and we, we would have been able to do the things that we're doing without the unique technical elements that Franz brings to the table. And so at this point, I am uh, pleased to introduce Jans Eichmann, CEO of Franz, who is here to say a few words about our relationship and the, uh, the products that we're using. Okay, so here is Jans. Can you maybe uh, go to the next slide? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we're always really happy to do uh, uh, webinars or go to meetings with uh, webinars with um, our partners, um, and especially happy if they use uh, our entire stack. So what we can say about us is, well, we have this uh, semantic graph database, Allegro Graph, which is um, uh, ready for production environments and actually running in many, many places uh, in production and not going to go through this list. And so we're also 100% um, W3C compliant. Can you go to the next slide? So we make sure that... Um, Whatever we do in our development, we always stay in tune with uh, what W3C prescribes. And then we have some um, very unique, um, I'm trying to get to the next slide, some unique features. Um, some of the people in the audience might have used our tool Graph, a really great uh, tool, a graphical use interface for triple stores. And so another unique thing that more and more of our customers are starting to use is our JavaScript compiler, so you can do server-side uh, uh, programming. Um, and then in, within a month, we'll come out with a new feature we call n-dimensional indexing, where you can actually have uh, data types that consist of uh, multiple scalars. So for example, you could have x, y, z, and t, and then do very, very fast uh, multi-dimensional queries. So what I'm going to show you next month is where we have a large telephone databases and where within a few milliseconds I can find all the phone calls that were made to or from a particular place uh, within a particular time interval and do that as fast as possible. Um, and we're we'll even going to talk in March about Elasticsearch, but <clears throat> What I really want to stress is that, um, so yes, we're production ready, we are uh, W3C compliant, but then we have some capabilities that only, um, I would say, about 10% of our customers use, um, but it's a really amazing uh, capability to, uh, if you are willing to work with the Electrograph direct Lisp client, then what you get is a, a common Lisp compiler, so you can basically write uh, your own algorithms, query languages, and execute them at C speed. Uh, we have a full um, Prolog compiler. So if you want to work with rules, then we have one of the most powerful languages uh, ever written for artificial intelligence available to do, well, both declarative programming and build your own rule-based systems. And we see more and more that customers are using um, um, well, doing work with both semantic graph databases and um, dealing with uncertainty. And so we're doing more and more with machine learning. And we created, uh, as part of this, an interface to Netica, a Bayesian belief network. Um, and we see, actually, that more and more people are using this particular capability. And so I don't know why, but it's mostly in the intelligence agency and DOD that people are willing to work with the Lego graph 
direct list client and Haystacks is one of the examples that have done an amazing job with this tool and so I want to give now the uh, floor back to uh, Robert. Thank you, Jan. Um, now a bit about insiders. Uh, so to begin, I, I just want to say a little bit about why Haystacks. So you know, we're a, a relatively young company. We were formed in 2012 through the combination of three independent technology companies. Um, and we were formed to address um, several different areas in analytics, secure cloud prep collaboration, and large-scale network management and cybersecurity. Uh, we're in use at the Pentagon. We, we manage one of the, the large networks there. Uh, we're the, the leading cybersecurity provider for the Coast Guard, and we run their cybersecurity operations center. And then we manage and arch we architect and manage uh, three global networks that uh, service over 15,000 users. Uh, another side of our company, our public safety solutions are used nationwide every day uh, by law enforcement. We're the, the standard um, software solution used for major national entertainment events, including uh, 40 or so public events in the last year. Uh, we're in use in 15 of the 20 largest urban areas to keep uh, people safe uh, from natural hazards and terrorism threats. So we have a, a long experience in this in this area. Um, and so let's just go ahead and begin. So a little bit about how we see insiders right now. Um, you know, as organizations uh, centralize and network more and more of their data, insider threats are becoming uh, more common and more impactful in their, their uh, effect. And so what you see here are a number of the high-profile insider threats that have impacted government clients in recent years. Um, all of these organizations that we list here are well-funded, um, you know, have a, a large IT budget, and, and, th and yet they're still impacted by insider threats. So, you know, the, the message here is if, if they can't protect their data, then no organization is safe. And if you look outside the government, you have uh, a similar picture. Um, you know, there's, here's another example of, of a number of high-profile uh, events that have occurred just in the last few years. You know, in 2013, a target breach was, was perpetrated by insiders who gained access through their HVAC system. Uh, AT&T last, uh, I think it was August, um, had an insider that released uh, 1,600 records, including Social Security numbers, driver's records, uh, license data. And then just last week, uh, I think it was January 6th of this year, Morgan Stanley had over 900 of their wealth management clients, uh, about 10 percent of their entire wealth management portfolio for high net worth individuals, um, an individual had access to those records and was going to be selling that information um, to other, other third parties. So, you know, if, if you look, uh, according to a 2013 report from Forrester Research, insider incidents are the most common causes of data breaches. Uh, the, the, the size of these, you know, the, the, they range from anywhere from 100 to $325 per record, um, and you can see how that just adds up very, very quickly. Uh, the average data breach in the industry is about $3.5 in impact to the, the host organization, uh, but for large breaches like some of the ones you see here, it can be tens of, of times uh, that, that, that size. And, you know, when we look at this space, um, the traditional, or excuse me, the, the current best practice approach to um, dealing with the insider threat is an evolution of current network security policy. So organizations are monitoring network traffic to um, identify malicious behavior and malicious actions. And in our view, this is too late. By the time you see activity on your network, uh, the event is already taking place. Um, and, you know, with traditional security, this is really the, the best approach you can have because you, you won't know that there's a malicious actor until he's on your network. But with insiders, it's, they're not a typical actor. They're on your network every day. And so there's other things you can do. Um, certainly, you can look at uh, time in, time out information, access cards, other things that they're, they're doing on the IT side. But you can also look at other uh, off-premises, things that are happening with your employees uh, or with individuals um, outside of work. And where that helps you is 
you know, when you look at some of the, the IT monitoring solutions, um, they're very good at, at detecting things, but a lot of what is apparently malicious behavior is actually benign activity. And so what becomes very important then is to have an ability to prioritize those events and be able to make sense of them. And so what, what we believe is if you take a whole person view of the world, you can um, prioritize the, those things that you are seeing based on other information that, that you're feeding into your, into your system. And so you know, when we look at the, the way that we kind of bring this to market, the things that we're doing to monitor uh, traffic on the network, we've, we call that silicon. Uh, the things that the, the, the model that we, we produce to monitor you know, whole person life events activity, we call that carbon. And both of those two models are enabled by an underlying technology platform that we call Fusion. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So the way that Fusion works is it continuously um, uh, integrates information from a variety of public and private sources, such as employee records, background checks, um, employee service records, public record searches, and, and this information is applied to a model and automatically evaluated as it comes in to create a prioritized view of all monitored personnel based on known information. And organizations can then use that prioritization to drive additional data collection or to prioritize their response. Uh, and the models that we have in silicon and carbon are developed and integrated as, as part of the configuration process for the fusion system. So um, data collect, excuse me, connections, connections to data are also configured as well. So I want to talk now about how we configure fusion and how we build the models that we have in silicon and carbon. So the, the process that we go through, it's a, it's a, a six-step process. And the process starts with the underlying policy that you have as an organization. Uh, using policy standards and documents and interviews with subject matter experts, we extract key concepts and relationships using natural language and domain-specific terms that are um, relevant to the domain that you're, you're thinking about, either information security or, um, you know, I'll say whole life event security. Uh, and this information is used to describe an influence graph um, and ultimately, we convert it into configuration directives that we have in the system. And here's an example of what one of those looks like when we, when we deploy it in our system. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about how this and how it works later on in the talk. But I show you this here to see, you know, as you look at the, the words in here, these are all domain-specific terms. These are the same kinds of words that you're going to hear from your domain experts and from your policy documents. So the, the translation from source material into configuration is, is a, a straightforward process. And the next thing we do when we have that configuration, is, configuration information is we put it back in the system and it processes it. And what it creates is a fully realized Bayesian influence model. This is an example here of the, the model that we have in Carbon. It, it's looking at uh, life events. So, um, you know, people getting born, people getting uh, jobs, people having drug, event, drug issues, um, people having financial issues. All of those things are considered in this model. It has about 700 nodes. And it's all described using, initially, that simple language. What are the concepts? What are the relationships between those concepts? And the translation, as I mentioned, from underlying you know, organizational policy um, to a model like this is quick and repeatable. And we've, we've done it many times. Uh, and then the, the next step with that, with that model, then, is to connect it to real-world events. And we do that via uh, a process that I'm going to describe now. One part is ingestion rules, where we're taking real-world events and saying that that's how it impacts the model you know, this way. Um, and then we also, when it, when it comes to processing live data, um, we, we, we connect live information sources, either, again, from your network or from uh, public record searches, public data. And, and we, we write collection rules where we establish how frequently we're going to pull those information sources, or if they're push sources, uh, how frequently we expect updates. And then we modify or develop a 
a model that, that we have in the system we call our uh, event ontology. And you know, the way to think about that is the ontology describes the events and things that, that can be. Uh, extracted data from live sources describes the things that do exist. Um, and so, you know, once, you, once you've identified what those, you know, where that information feeds into that event model, then we have extraction rules where we actually uh, enable the system to process those live data sources and push information into the ontology, which then goes on into the, uh, the overall, overall model. And when we, we bring all that together, we get a system that looks a little bit like the, oops, like this. Uh, this is a, a, a view of one of the screens we have in our, our web-based interface. Um, here we're looking at person details uh, for an individual. So you know, every, every monitored individual gets a, a view like this. And um, what you see there on the left side is a view of all the events that we've, what we've seen for an individual. Um, and, and that sort of forms what we know about a person. And then on the right side there, where you're seeing trustworthy, reliable, discrete, um, those are areas where the system has made inference based on those events. And for each one of those, you get a probabilistic display, as you would expect from a Bayesian model, of what the system thinks that it's, it it's sees with respect to that factor. So any one of those 700 nodes I mentioned uh, earlier in that carbon model, we could query and, and create a result like this. Uh, typically, we show only the, the most relevant 20 or so uh, you know, high-level result nodes. We also show um, other information that enables you to interpret that result. So you'll see there on that second line uh, of a histogram of all of the other individuals in the monitor population. And that becomes really important when you're trying to uh, interpret what it is that it's that the model is telling you. So you you know you know some some of these uh, factors are very tightly grouped. Others tend to be a little bit more dispersed. Uh, we also show the median, so you know where again where it's falling with respect to that. Um, now all of that is based on a view that is now. Um, but one of the other things that we can do with this model is look back through time, or watch a person going forward through time as you're running this system in a live mode and see how uh, the events in that person's life and events that you're seeing from um, live sources, such as network information, or from public records as they come in, how they're changing what the system sees um, over time. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this, because uh, how we apply events to the model is an area of particular nuance, and we've got a, a, a part of this talk where we're going to spend some time talking about how we deal with that and, and some of the problems we faced when we did that. So that's just a, a quick view of what the, the system looks like from a, an interface perspective. If we were to look at the technology stack, uh, you know, we run on uh, commodity hardware. Uh, we run on any of the various different flavors of, of Linux. We've used Ubuntu. We've used CentOS. We've used Red Hat. Red Hat. Uh, you can see that down there at the bottom uh, where we're using Franz technology, Allegro CL, Allegro Graph, and, and their Allegro Prolog um, to form some of the foundational components of the system. On top of that, we layer a, a number of proprietary elements, uh, that Fusion model and the, the Fusion engine there. And then the web interface is, is serviced by a, a REST interface in the middle there. And that REST interface serves both uh, web interfaces for user or analytic viewers, uh, but then we also can, can support system-to-system -system connections by that REST interface or offline analytic tools such as R or Excel or BI tools such as uh, Tableau to enable you to pull information out of the system and consume it in any way that you might choose to do so. Uh, and then you can see off on the left side there where we specialize the model based on um, that configuration that we developed earlier, I discussed earlier, is in that fusion model layer. That's what turns it from the generic uh, base system into a, a system that implements a specific model for a specific pur purpose, such as silicon for online and network monitoring, and carbon for whole life and uh, person monitoring. So I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Bob Schrag, our chief scientist. And he's going to describe in a bit more detail some of the nuance of just one of the challenges we faced to create this, uh, this capability. 
And that's how we connect data from high and low volume sources into the system. So, Dr. Shrub? Yeah, thanks, Rob. So, uh, some of us, as you can see here, had a paper at the recent uh, STIDS conference in Fairfax, Virginia, back in November. Um, uh, and so, the, uh, the paper for that talk uh, and the slides um, from the full length presentation are uh, posted on the STIDS website. There are links to those in uh, the last slide in this presentation, so you all uh, can get into as much detail as you want to. Um, uh, so Rob has talked about uh, models that we're, we're building, and uh, Jan's talked particularly about the, the, our, our use of the stack. What, I, I'm, I'm going to try to show you, just, just as a preview, what we're doing um, uh, in not just Allegro Graph, but the Allegro Prolog interface to Allegro Graph, and how we drop through the uh, Allegro Common List to Netica API that Franz funded uh, to manipulate our Bayesian network models, um, the ones we build with Fusion. So there's some detail in this presentation about just how we um, how we build out a generic person model into a specific person model. Um, so Rob has already introduced our carbon and silicon models um, uh, and their basic purposes, um, and and also some of the event types. So uh, I just want to make the connection between the brand name that we have, Carbon, and uh, the other brand name, Silicon, and the notation that's used in the paper, because we were a little bit more guarded in the paper. Uh, we referred to Carbon as M sub C or Model C, and to Silicon as M sub S, Model S. Um, uh, after showing you a little bit about those, um, I'll show you some results from a model that stitches those together neatly by combining the specifications of the kind that Rob was showing you earlier. Um, so if you go to the paper, just, just realize that uh, those are the correspondences. Okay, so what we're trying to do um, with this part of the talk is address the problem where we want to apply the event evidence um, that we have about a person to uh, various random variables that represent concepts that are generally attributes of people in a Bayesian network that we use to assess risk. And we want to do so in such a way that we account for the different relevance of these events as they change over time. Uh, something that happened yesterday is a lot more relevant than happened five years ago, generally, and, and things can become more or less, less relevant depending on what kind of thing they are. Uh, and we'll show some examples of that. So just to kind of round out the little bit of notation we're going to use in here, we've got a person P, there's some set of events E that that person has uh, been the subject of, we have built using Fusion a generic Bayesian network that's been compiled out of our specification language into a Netica form. Um, all of our random variables are Boolean concepts, and the and, and we're we're coming up with a degree of belief in each concept. We're looking specifically at um, top level concepts like is somebody trustworthy uh, in this talk. And for each event, we'll have a reference time, t, um, uh, at which we will compute the relevance. But, but what we're going to do in each case is we're going to specialize this generic Bayesian network that's been developed using the Fusion framework to reflect the specific set of events. Uh, and that's, well, that's like the timelines Rob was showing you. Um, this is just another view. The, Concepts in the bubbles are random variables in our network, the person attribute concepts. As Rob showed you, this 
network for carbon has some 700 nodes. So this is a very elided view. Um, and we note uh, the strength of influence by the thickness of an arrow. Um, we note the polarity of the influence by the, the style of the arrow. So see that if someone is a reliable, if someone is reliable that's reliable. I have to mute a couple people here so we don't get the echo. There we go. So if somebody is reliable, that's a strong positive indicator that they're trustworthy. If on the other hand, someone is over there in the law-breaking section of the network, that's a strong negative indication that they're trustworthy. And the Bayesian network balances out these uh, probabilistic influences. What I've shown along the bottom here are just categories of events, and we've already seen examples of those. So what we want to talk about here is just what we do to process these events and attach them to the Bayesian network. So we've got two approaches to doing this. The, the one we use for the, the what Rob has referred to as life events in carbon, we call ingestion. And we have uh, a set of ingestion rules for processing different kinds of events. And I'll show you some examples of those in a little bit. Um, basically, if, if you look off to the left at the random variable noted pi, that's, that is a concept in the generic person Bayesian network. Um, and we trigger an ingestion rule for that concept when we find an event that matches it in the event ontology. So um, misdemeanor assault is one. We've shown an instance of that here. And uh, that event becomes an influence on the person attribute concept. We set, we also have a temporal relevance node pi. Um, we establish a, uh, a half-life which can be decay, it can also be uh, a growth function, uh, as we'll show you in a second here. Uh, there's a lot of details about this in the paper. Um, just for brevity, that's most of what I want to say here. Because of the way we're extending the Bayesian network with each event in a person's history, um, this technique is appropriate when you've got, say, a few dozen events. Uh, and when those events are pretty meaningful individually. So that, that's the case in the, the carbon side, where we were dealing with issues of person trustworthiness and considering things like the risk of information disclosure. Um, well, here's, 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 a, here's a timeline uh, like the one Rob showed earlier. Um, I just want to point out that um, uh, I mentioned that, that you, know, you can have relevance, the, the relevance an event can decay over time, and that's typically what happens when the event is over. So you see uh, the green line uh, second from the bottom that, that peaks uh, shortly after um, this person has graduated high school or, or the, the first uh, time point we, we uh, queried the model for after he graduated high school. And then it starts to fall off. Well, while he was in high school, um, his, uh, our, his credibility for being committed to school was growing. Um, you might notice that his credibility for being committed to a career was growing at the same time, even though you know we don't have any direct uh, events that he hasn't he hasn't been employed yet uh, that we know of. Uh, but still, we've got connections in our generic person networks that establish that when this. Uh, commitment to school is an indicator of reliability, which another indicator of that is commitment to work and the influences propagate. And so we tend to believe that someone who has done well and followed through with high school is going to follow through and do well in his first job. But that's relevant. Uh, maybe a year or two later, it becomes 
less relevant and, and sort of settles back down to where it was as a baseline after a few more years. So I was talking about how the, uh, the, the ingestion technique that we've used is appropriate when we've got, a, say, a few dozen events because we are adding individual nodes, pairs of nodes, to the Bayesian network for each event that we encounter. When we go to the silicon domain of computer network events, um, then we're talking about hundreds of thousands of events per person. and you know, hundreds of events per day even. And um, it's, it's not necessarily the case that uh, these things have the same salience individually as the life events that we were looking for. So we wanted to devise a different technique. And what we came up with is uh, an event summarization technique here we've got the same sort of random variable pi that's included in our generic person model, um, but we're also including directly in the generic person model a summary variable we call uh, big delta here for each event type that we're going to consider. The, the one that's mentioned here is copying uh, a decoy file, decoy file to some external location. So an example would, of that would be uh, copying a file that uh, a system administrator or an information security officer has salted into uh, the employee accessible file system that says um, something like uh, uh, private management data or employee salaries or sensitive customer data. And you know, if, if somebody uh, who shouldn't be looking that, at that gets curious and looks at it, and especially if they do something like uh, uh, send an email or, or copy it to uh, an external website, that's something we want to watch out for. Um, so I guess I've covered this slide. Oh, I did want to say that the technique we use then with uh, uh, the summary that we develop in Netica then is to enter a likelihood finding here as opposed to uh, setting a hard finding on the random variable delta. Now the paper includes uh, quite a bit, I'm sorry, it includes several charts including um, intermediate metrics that we compute along the way to getting our likelihood finding. Um, we call that a suspicion warrant and um, that's the main thing that's going to inform our risk. But summarization has several other goals. We're trying to compact the volume of events so that um, not only do we not have too many random variables in the network, we also don't have to store uh, an arbitrary number of events indefinitely because we're using a, a, a decay scheme uh, to aggregate those as well. We reflect the temporal relevance um, with buckets of increasing duration size on the event statistics. And we use um, anomaly detection techniques to measure variation in the volumes of events, both within an individual's history and across the population. And finally, we develop these suspicion warrants. So the paper uh, uses some data from uh, U.S. CERT that was developed for a DARPA program. Um, what we've done here is to include something that's a little more stylized to, to give you more of a feel for the progression. This is a person who's, uh, he starts on day 32 accessing uh, these 
decoy files and, and copying them somewhere external and, and does that more and more every day. So it starts off being something novel and ends up being something that we've seen before, and, and that's, that's why we get the shape of curve that we do here. Uh, nobody else in the population is doing this right now. So what that does is um, this is a timeline just based on the silicon data. And you see that that creates, uh, for the influences we specified, it creates an increase in the belief that this person is exploiting the IT system as an insider. What I want to show you next is how when we add life events of the kind we look at in carbon, um, we get a, uh, a more informed effect here. And so that's, that's the next one. So if, if this, the, the, the umber segment here that's highlighted is the same one I've just shown you. Um, it's steeper. Um, and what that's doing is it's giving the information security officer uh, a direct heads up that, look, this guy's network activity is something that you should prioritize looking on just because of what we know about his other events in his life. And um, so here, just, just, to, just to cap this off, uh, we've, we've shown you a, uh, some, by way of timeline, we've showed you some results on carbon, now on silicon, and now on the combined model as well. Uh, Rob has already shown you the specification that we were using. Um, the uh, highlighted concepts at the top are random variables you've already seen in the timeline graph. The concept down at the bottom uh, that's highlighted untrustworthy, that's the, the link between the uh, carbon and silicon models that we've made here. And all we had to do was uh, append these two specifications together. So as, as John pointed out, uh, we're using a bunch of the uh, Allegro technology stack. Um, I, I guess I've already mentioned most of these things, but I want to point out that, that uh, there's something unique in the way in, in, in this technology combination because of the fact that Allegro Graph is itself written in Allegro Common Lisp. And when we use the Lisp direct client to Allegro Graph, we're actually um, using a language space that shares memory with Allegro Graph itself. So we can use all this power that's in uh, on the client side, in Allegro Common Lisp, um, in Allegro Prolog interface to Allegro Graph or in other Lisp macros like Iterate Cursor, and not suffer any performance penalty. And, and in the middle of those things, we can drop into the ACL genetic API, and um, we can do the things we need to do to add nodes, add evidence, um, um, and query the Bayesian network for beliefs, um, which we then write back to Allegro Graph, and, and, and that feeds our, our user interface stack that Rob had shown you earlier. So, so let me just drill into a couple of these things a little bit. Uh, this is one of our ingestion rules. You can see at the bottom that we're calling out to Lisp. Um, uh, let me back up and say this is just syntactic sugar around the Allegro Prolog assert predicate, does some error checking. Uh, then the head of the predicate is this first form process reported event. Uh, that's the thing that launches all the ingestion rules and checks against reported events, which is what the other predicate does. It backtracks through the rules. When it finds something, that uh, matches, then we call this side effecting, create event concept indication, um, and we can pass through um, whatever we want to. Uh, you know, if you, if you haven't used the Allegro Prolog, um, 
you might not know that it, 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 it well, it has, it has all the things that you normally expect, expect from Prolog, like logical combinations and, and, and or, uh, as well as logic programming control, like varieties of if and cut, um, as well as uh, being able to use list predicates as prolonged predicates. So we get a tremendous amount of expressive power out of um, this combination. And because LISP has this great treatment of program as data, we can also um, write macros to our heart's content to author RDF ontologies and conforming data sets. Uh, that's what we've done here along the left column and the right column. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, leave, uh, I'll leave some details to the paper except to say that um, when we're done, uh, we, can, we can load the resulting RDF OWL ontology and data set into Protege and browse it. What I like about this is I don't have to do anything with angle brackets. Uh, I don't have to work through a GUI to do my authoring if I don't want to. This is the environment that um, we find to be you know, the most comfortable and the most powerful for authoring. But on the other hand, if, uh, if you want to use Protege, that's, that's, that's a great validation tool for me to, to look at things, and it's always great to have uh, another view on your data to make sure you've got everything the way you want it to be. So, Rob, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Um, well, yeah, I guess the only thing I would add here, Bob, is um, the, the point behind showing that view in Protege um, is to say that the, the, the intermediate products that, we, that we're creating as part of our configuration are, are proper, uh, well-formed, you know, and a well-formed OWL ontology so you can look at it in any other tool that you want to. Uh, to make sure, or you can integrate it with an ontology that you have of your own. Uh, the same thing goes with the, the Bayesian model that we, that we create out of our modeling process. Um, it's a properly well-formed Netica model. You can load it up into Netica. Uh, uh, user interface tool and look at it there so you can um, make sure it's performing the way that you want it to. Um, so when, when we're showing you these configuration tools, uh, you know, understand that, that what you're getting out of them are standards-based uh, results that then also then feed into the runtime engine. Um, I guess that's all I would add at the architecture level. Okay. So I guess I guess we're on to our our, uh, our our slide of references here and yep. um, open for questions. Yeah, so while, while you were talking, Bob, I, I saw a couple questions come across the chat, and I'm just going to kind of address these. Um, the first one was, how does it scale? Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take each of these and feel free to add in, Bob, or uh, it, as, you, as you feel the need to. Um, right now, you know, we, we run, we have run um, in excess of 100,000 people on a laptop. That takes an overnight uh, exercise. Um, the nature of this processing is that uh, it's very uh, pipelineable. Each each person is is treated individually. So, um, you know, we would we would anticipate that that it would scale very quickly and very easily to larger hardware. Um, another question I saw was uh, how many people have you processed? This is related to the first one. How many people have you processed and have you caught anyone? Uh, uh, I, I'm chuckling a little bit. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I guess all I'll say there is we are in use in a number of different uh, organization clients. We're not at liberty to say who we've identified and how many people we've, we've processed those clients. Um, how would you compare this product with a uh, with like something like Palantir? Um, what I would say there is, you know, Palantir is a bit more of a an analytic tool. It in the sense that it's designed to be used by an analyst. And um, our tool is, is really aimed at a, a complete solution. Um, Palantir works with and, and can help you identify connections in data that you already have. 
Uh, that's what it's really good at is finding those connections and, and helping you make sense of what they're telling you. Um, what our system is doing is, is looking at information as it comes in and making inference on that as it arrives. Um, so yeah, I, I would characterize it that way. It's, if you want to add anything there, Bob. Um, okay. and, and then the last one was, um, can you talk about you know, how you integrate with uh, you know, where you get your data from um, and how you integrate with social media? You know, we mentioned that earlier. Uh, and the short answer there is, you know, when we when we configure this for an organization, um, we expect to integrate with proprietary sources, internal sources, so network information, uh, HR systems, uh, where you're going to have access to um, badge in, badge out data, um, printer use, network activity, those kinds of things, and then uh, public records information, such as information you might get out of a LexisNexis, for example. Um, but ultimately, all of those configurations are um, a little bit custom for, for each use. We have a number of, of uh, I, I hesitate to call them plugins, but um, it, you know, instances where we've done it before, so we're able to accelerate for certain kinds of data sources. But ultimately, the integration is, is always a little bit custom. Um, I think that hits all the, the, the questions. I have one here from the audience, the local audience. You talked about scalability. Yes. Uh, but you didn't mention that the bottleneck is really the base net. That that is true. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, the the time that the system spends per person, um, I, I would correct me if I'm wrong here, Bob. It's like on the 80, 90 percent is spent in the evaluation of the network itself, the apparatus yeah. for digesting events, creating the person-specific Bayesian network, um, and then reporting the results back out into Allegro Graph. Uh, is, is, I don't want to say in the noise, but it's dominated by the time processing the network. And so um, we are very definitely compute bound, um, and bigger compute makes us happy. Just looking at questions that have come in here. Oh, I see. So uh, we have a question that says, um, how do you collect life events? Um, it's a combination of factors. So for us, a life event is something like um, you know, birth, death. Some of that you're going to get through background checks. Some of that you're going to get through um, information that an employee or a, uh, an individual shares with the organization. Um, some of that may be via their interaction with the organization. So if you think about, um, you know, a person who who, who goes gets sent on travel, or uh, you know, if we were looking at a, say a DoD person, someone who gets deployed somewhere, all of those things would would be considered life events for us. Uh, we're also able to collect information from public sources that, that we would uh, could purchase, such as a LexisNexis or something along those lines. Uh, another question here is, what is the amount of time it takes? to ingest especially unstructured data sources and to normalize events, especially carbon sources. These seem to be, these seem time consuming and presume A, access to those databases and B, continuous, or, and B, continuous, hopefully automated updates. Um, thinking about that one. I, you know, I, short answer is yes. When it comes to A, um, our presumption is that we have access to the data sources that, that we expect to consume. Um, we, we, you know, we're, not, we're not special. We don't have access to any proprietary sources that another uh, wouldn't have, um, but we make better use of what we do get, and I guess the way I would like to think about it. Um, and we would expect that, yes, we're getting um, continuous access to those sources. So it, again, in the case of public record sources, um, most of those organizations can, can stream that data, data to you as they identify it. So if they are doing um, a scan for a, a public records check on an individual, they will push an event to you when they identify it. Most of those organizations will look on a, a daily basis for a population. Um, I, I hopefully that answers the question there. And then uh, there's a question here about how do you ensure 
ENDA compliance. I'm not sure what that refers to. Employment Non-Discrimination Act? I don't uh, think that it passed. Yeah, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Um, I'm contemplating that one. Uh, I mean, I, I guess what I'll tell you so far is I know when we uh, have been working with our, our various different clients on this, um, the legal issue has come up um, from time to time. And the, the short answer there is, you know, we're, we're happy to consume whatever source of the information those organizations feel comfortable consuming. Um, you know, it's ultimately on the, the, the using organization uh, for what they choose to use it for. We are not a, a tool that someone would use to make an employment decision pre-hoc or prior to employment. Pre-hire. Yeah. Pre-hire. Um, yeah, so there's another, another follow-up on that question. Um, issues with social media inadvertently raising compliance issue, issues. Um, I, I guess I have two points there. When it comes to social media, um, three, now that I think about it, social media as a general rule um, is not information dense. So if you think about something like Twitter, you've got a you know, very, very small set of, of characters to, to convey information there. Um, there's not a lot you can often get from that. Uh, it's also unstructured. And that is a little bit out of the lane of, of what this tool is doing uh, to apply structure to that information. We have other products that we work on uh, that are Haystacks products that, that do some of that structuring, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, the other part about social media in particular is um, there's a, a real identity resolution challenge when it comes to social media. So um, again, that is something that we uh, would do offline from this tool to establish the connection between uh, entities that you know and that you're monitoring and whatever online entity identities that they might they might share. Okay, well, I, I, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for spending the time to listen to us. It's been uh, a pleasure, pleasure to, to talk with you and, and share this work that we're doing. Um, France has been a great partner for us, and we continue to look forward to, to do work with them in the future. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will uh, post this talk and these, these slides on both our site, and I believe Franz is going to post it on your site um, shortly after we finish up here today. Again, thank you for your time. Thanks a lot.